Terrence Blanchard is talking about a life in music and so many things to be proud of in recent times. Uh, just honored with the Grammy Award for Best Opera Recording for Champion. Last year, honored with the Grammy Award for Best Opera Recording for Fire Shut Up in My Bones. These two operas are the tip of, we'd like to think, an iceberg, to use a terrible cliche, or the beginning of a whole new adventure for the form, for storytelling. Going back to classic opera, they were exciting, there was conflict, there was violence, there were things that thrilled an audience that they never saw depicted before, and, and your operas have gone to these places too, but on very contemporary terms. My uh, composition teacher, Roger Dickinson, was the guy that kind of prepared me for this years ago. When I started doing film work, I was excited about the opportunity, and he broke it down. He said, that's great, but you're gaining experience in writing for orchestra to do something much bigger than film score. And I went, really? I you know, couldn't imagine what that could be. Then all of a sudden, Jim Robinson calls me up and from Opera Theater St. Louis and asked me to write an opera. And once I get into it, I started to see what Roger was talking about. Because then all of my experiences as a jazz musician, studying as a com composer, young composition student, uh, film scoring, everything, it all comes to bear to, to to tell these stories, you know. And that was the most important thing that Roger told me was don't write an opera, tell a story, you know, and that helped me a great deal. So it's it's been an interesting journey, you know, because now that I'm I'm in it, I've developed a certain man, passion and love for the genre and being in the theater. You know, it's it's an amazing experience, you know, once you have it. And uh, I feel blessed to be on the creative end of it, you know, because I've enjoyed it immensely. And your father planted that seed in you, but I have to wonder as a young one, if you, you know, sat with him and listened to Carmen or Rigoletto or whatever, went to see the productions, would you ever, ever in a million years project yourself into that medium? Or could you know that you'd be redefining it in a whole new way? My father used to make me listen to it, you know, and then when the stuff would come on PBS, and he meant, come here, come here, sit down, sit down, sit down, now watch this, watch this, you know, and then he explained the characters to me and what was going on, you know, and I've often wondered if listening to that music helped me develop my sense of melody, you know, um, because when I look back on everything that I've written in the film world, you know, when I'm writing for full orchestra, my sense of melodic content comes from a vocal perspective, if will, if you will, you know. Um, and uh, it's <laughs> it's one of those things. My dad's no longer with us, but it's one of those things, man. Where I can hear him going, "See, I told you, you, you play too many you play too many notes when you're playing all that other stuff." <laughs> just, just <laughs> <laughs> do you think? in terms of that structure that maybe the arias from opera, whether you knew it or not, they were creeping up on you and maybe uh, have had more of an influence than the standard songs or pop songs of the rock and roll era, you know, which is really your age group. Yeah, no, I think it, it had a huge impact, you know. I remember singing Carmen all the time when I was a kid, you know, all of those things, even the musicals, man, Fiddle on the Roof, my father was a big fan of that, you know. Took me to see it when I was a kid. Man, we never took me to, to the movies. He took me to two movies, Jungle Book and uh, and Fiddle on the Roof. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> <laughs> I got taken to Fiddler on the roof, at, roof as a class trip when I was in public school growing up in the Bronx. They got us all in the subway, and they sent us down to the Zigfield Theater, and we saw it in 70 millimeter with Ooh. stereo. And yeah. it was so immersive and in the very beginning tradition and the size of that screen you know that that framing and and the landscape i i just was I, of course at that age had never seen anything that big and and the music hit me like a truck it was incredible those melodies you know if i were a rich man you know all of those things stuck around in the back of my brain so you know they probably had a huge impact on how i think and feel about melodic content 
At its core, uh, Fire Shut Up In My Bones is about evolving, and Charles M. Blow said afterwards, I think he said it to actually the Will Liverman, that I don't recognize the person who was my younger self anymore. And, and we're talking about this in your journey in music, in a way. Do you have those moments now? I just had it, actually, over the Christmas holidays. My daughter here in London found the first album that I ever did with, with Art Blakey. And uh, she bought it and gave it to me as a Christmas gift. And uh, I downloaded the music and played it in the house, and it just brought back a ton of memories, ton of memories of experiences I forgot that I had. Terrence Blanchard talking to us, whether it's Will Liverman or Julia Bullock or Angel Blue, there are young black artists today who are some of opera's most prominent stars. The difference is that they have a platform that Jesse Norman or Leontine Price did not have, which is to have you know material that goes beyond the classic repertoire, that doesn't take place in another time, that speaks to a contemporary experience and addresses the thing that we've identified as a goal, this need for more inclusion, but, you know, what, what is the, the means to that end? And, and you are opening up that in, in an amazing way. These artists are surely you must be thinking of them or are inspired by them in their journey as you create. Tell us about that. Oh, definitely. I mean, you know, I think one of the things that makes me the proudest about what it is that we do is being able to create vehicles for the for that level of talent that has existed in the African American community in the operatic world for generations, you know, and to create content that they could relate to socially as well as musically is a true blessing, you know, uh, because now we're bringing our culture to the stage, we're telling our stories on the stage, and it broadens the experience for everybody, for the listeners as well which is one of the reasons why wherever my operas have gone, you know, the reviews have been the same. It's been the most diverse audiences they've seen in an opera house, you know, which to me speaks to how there's a demographic of folk that have been overlooked, not paid attention to, you know. And now with these productions, with Malcolm X being there, with Anthony Davis, those things hopefully can speak to a larger issue, you know, about how some people have felt left out, you know, of that community. And it's not because of their lack of interest, you know, which we've seen. Um, I, th I think the other thing that makes me proud is that we've learned that most of the people who have come to my productions have bought tickets to other productions. This kind of radical thing is settling into opera for the first time and on your watch. And it seems to me that the road is wide open from here and audiences coming in are prepared in a way that the original audiences for jazz or hip hop or even, you know, old school R&B weren't. I saw a ledger at the Met where William Grant Still's work had been rejected three times in the 30s. And... Sometimes now with my productions, there's some rhythmic things that are not necessarily totally really difficult. They're just part of the jazz language and not part of the operatic language. And, you know, sometimes orchestras have had slight difficulty in approaching how to play those phrases and rhythms. And the thing that I kept thinking about was, you know, if all of this other music would have been accepted you know, into the culture in the 30s, that may not be an issue now, you know. And it's a, it's a tough thing to deal with because it's a subject a lot of people don't like to talk about. But it's another, it's another um, statement of how, you know, we have to open up the genre to all different types of composers and musicians, you know, because there's so many other people, man, from so many different walks of life who have something to say and probably could say it in a very profound way in this genre, you know, and let's face it, you know, opera is the most, it's the most celebrated, the most technically the, 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 the difficult and the most beautiful musical experience you'll ever have in a the theater, you know, and given that when you find people who have something to say, no matter what culture they're coming from, opera is a beautiful stage and a platform 
to, to tell those stories. Fire Shut Up in My Bones returns to the Metropolitan Opera stage on April 8th. It plays through May 2nd. Uh, when I saw Champion uh, later last year in its return to the Met, um, I was so struck by the multimedia aspect of it. You come from film. Opera was the original movies. People went to see something larger than life that they had never seen in their lives before. They would leave their village to come to the city to see it. I'm talking about 17th, 18th, 19th century. This was the event of a lifetime. And I thought at that moment, this is an event of a lifetime because we're not seeing this in a multiplex in middle America. We're seeing the same technology at use, but it's integrated now. Uh, in this kind of sacred space, you know, this high art form. And as I mentioned, hip hop or jazz before, those are commercial music forms. Opera never was and never will be a commercial form, but it's the new platform and it's where all these things are coming together. And especially if you'll speak to us about that technical aspect of integrating multimedia to an audience that kind of lives that way and expects it in their lives. Well, it's, it's, it's just part of the, the, the natural progression of things. You know, um, I was I was there at the Met, and I got tickets to go see Turin, though. <clears throat> and as soon as the stage, as soon as the curtain opened, I noticed that set. You know, I went, wow, we don't have one of those. You know, why can't we have something like that? And then the second act came, and then there was another amazing set. I'm like, yo, look at this, man. This is beautiful. And then I realized to build those sets today, it would cost millions and millions of dollars, you know. So there's a practical side to it too. But then the other part that I started to realize was when those sets are there, you're locked into that set for a whole act, you know? And what the digital video allows us to do is to treat it like a film, you know, where scenes can change, you know, throughout an act. You know, you don't have to be, you don't have to be stuck to one thing because, you know, those sets don't move you know, pretty easily. It takes time to move them. But with the digital video projection part of it, man, you can create images, you can create scenarios, and then they can morph and change into something right before your eyes. And that, in a sense, allows us to tell a broader story. Well, Terrence, I'll leave you with this. I think that we are dealing with the most educated music audience ever with the greatest access immediate access to all kinds of music. When you and I were about the same age, Winton is in our generation. You remember what it was like coming up with him. Your, your pads, you know, went, went in different ways, but there was this sort of collector mentality back then that, you know, you had these records or you listened to this kind of radio station. It was all compartmentalized now, and you had to wait, and you had to wait for a guy like me to rattle through the whole announce of what you played. Now, instant answers, you can YouTube a video of it, you can Google the artist, you've got your Spotify lists, you were the DJ, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I like to think that this audience is coming turbocharged into the opera house or to any other place armed with all this information. And, and they know Puccini and they know Stevie Wonder and they know Miles and they know, you know, Nas. So. Yes. There have been so many people who said they've gone to the opera for the first time by going to one of our productions, and they've been excited about it. <clears throat> and people, like you said, people are coming to the opera having done their homework, knowing what the stories are about, knowing my history, you know, knowing the history of the vocalists that are performing in the pieces, you know. And then that in itself, right there, one of the things that I think we don't talk about enough is, man, I've never seen a community like the vocal community and the African-American community in the operatic world, they are so supportive of each other, it's scary. You know, if somebody gets a leading role in one of the productions, man, on opening night, there's a plethora of vocalists who have flown in from various cities to support their friends because they understand how important it is to be there. And I, I watch that and I get inspired by that as well because that's also part of this whole new thing that you're talking about because that information flies around at lightning speed, you know, and when people come and experience the thing, next thing you know, it's up being blogged, people are posting about it and telling everybody else you need to go and experience this. That's something that's new and it's been really effective in how we've been getting the word out about what's been happening with these pieces.
Yeah, so interesting what you say about the African-American vocal community, because we must never lose sight of the fact that the church music of this community is what became rock and roll. It got bent and twisted into something very different, but there would be no rock and... I mean, the original 50s rock and roll came out of that. R&B came out of that. That opened up a door for all these other changes to happen, so it was, a, you pull that piece out of the jigsaw puzzle and we're not even having this conversation. So that's how that's deeply and organically it's connected. That's true. Terrence Blanchard, so many blessings and a, a, a double toast to you for racking up Grammys and for a year of honors. And most importantly, for you to be able to participate in this in this year long rollout uh, mm -hmm. as, as a performer and, and to use it as as fire in in your bones to keep on creating thanks so much for sharing so much with us today man thanks paul thanks for having the conversation with me man this has been a lot